So hello everyone, uh, thank you for joining this webinar. Um, just before we start, uh, I would like to wait just another minute uh, and then we're going to start with the presentation. Thank you. Okay, so thank you again. Um, welcome everyone and thanks again for joining the webinar. My name is Ines and I'll be your host today for the presentation. So today's first webinar is about measuring entropy and entanglement in a trapped ion quantum simulator, which is presented by our speaker Tiffany Bridges from the University of Innsbruck in Austria. I would also like to highlight that Tiffany's presentation will be followed by a brief talk given by Dr. Colin Coates, who is the product manager at Thunder Technology. And at the end of both presentations, we will have a Q&A session. So you can enter your, uh, your questions, also during the presentation, into the question box in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. But please keep in mind that the questions will only be answered at the end of both presentations. And also everyone who joined the webinar is in listen-only mode. So thank you for your attention, and I will now hand over to Tiffany. Thanks, Ines, for the nice introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm Tiff Bridges from um, the group of Rainer Blatt in Innsbruck. Um, so the University of Innsbruck and Ikoki in Innsbruck as well. Um, and this talk is about the work I did during my, my PhD, um, where we were looking at how to characterize um, entanglement through using entropy in a trapped ion quantum simulator. So I've tried to um, make this talk uh, understandable to a broad uh, group of people. So it'll start kind of with the basics of quantum simulation and quantum information. So if you're more of an expert in the field, um, hold on, because it gets a bit more technical towards the, the end of it. Um, but hopefully it's, it's understandable to most people. So um, yeah, I'll begin with quantum simulation. Um, I get asked a lot whether um, it's actually useful. So whether I do um, this just because I enjoy using trapped ions and lasers and it's fun to play around with, or if it actually does have some real world application. And the answer to that is yes, it does have a real application in the real world, hopefully in the future. Um, and the idea behind quantum simulation and, and quantum computation is really to be able to solve a class of problems which classical computers can't do. Um, and these um, problems can be those kind of problems which really just take too long to solve even with the best supercomputers that we have. So in principle, the classical computer could solve it, but if it takes 20,000 years in, to solve that problem, then it's, it's not really very useful for us. And you can ask the question, well, do any of these problems really matter? Um, any of the problems that we're trying to solve or hope to be able to solve in the future with simulators or, or quantum computers, um, are they applicable to real life? Um, and yes, because even just basic chemistry can be really, really difficult to simulate um, using a classical device. When you start to get um, quite a few molecules or some complicated interactions going on, then the problem just becomes far too uh, difficult to solve classically. And so if you can simulate even these basic chemical reactions, you can make a lot of processes far more energy efficient, for example. So in the production of fertilizers, which use ammonia and things like that. So it has the potential um, to really be useful, uh, I'd say in a broad uh, range of fields. Um, 
then you might ask, okay, do I want a quantum computer or do I want a quantum simulator and what are the differences between them? Um, and it's very similar to sort of a classical world. So a computer, a quantum computer is kind of like the, the analog to your laptop. Um, you give it a problem and it computes the answer to it and then gives you the answer out. Whereas a simulator, it's a little bit different. It's more like a, a wind tunnel. Um, if you're looking at aerodynamics and aerodynamic flow around an aeroplane, you don't solve that uh, problem exactly. A wind tunnel, for example, doesn't solve that problem exactly, but it simulates the environment. Um, and that's uh, very similar to what we're looking at doing with a quantum simulator. It's the same kind of thing. So we're using a small scale quantum system in order to imitate properties of a larger one that's of interest to us. Um, and the advantage of the small scale quantum system is that we can probe the, the dynamics and the states um, really particle by particle, because we should, in the ideal case, in designing these things, have really optimal control over all parts of our quantum simulator. And we can get a lot of insights into the workings of more complex systems then, um, which we can't do currently using classical computing techniques. And uh, the reason these computers and simulators um, have the advantage over the classical analogs to them um, is that they must be able to generate large amounts of entanglement um, in the systems, but we'll come back to that a little bit later on. So what does a quantum simulator actually look like? Um, so there's a lot of different platforms, um, such as superconducting qubits, uh, which you might have heard of in relation to Google and IBM, with Google claiming uh, quantum supremacy, and I think a couple of years ago now, and IBM still arguing against this. Um, there's trapped ions, and then there's also atoms in optical lattices. Uh, actually, all three of these platforms are also um, investigated at the University of Innsbruck, but I'm going to talk about trapped ions, because uh, that's what I was involved in, and that's what Rainer Blatt's group uh, works on mainly. So, um, a little overview of the talk. So, I'll go over some um, of the basics of quantum information and then the experimental setup that's used um, for the quantum simulator. I'll then uh, discuss a little bit more about entanglement. So, um, I already mentioned that to get this advantage over classical analogs, um, we need to be able to create a large amount of entanglement in the quantum system. Um, so in order to do that, we need to be able to characterize how much entanglement is then there. So how do we characterize it? And then an overview of a new protocol which uses a relation between entropy and entanglement in order to characterize it. And then finally, I'll show you some results of um, implementing this protocol on some 10 and 20 ion chains in our system. So uh, just some of the basics. So in classical um, computing, we have the basic unit of information, which is zero or one. Um, this can be represented by a voltage, for example. You can say zero is zero volts and one is, is five volts. It's quite a common way of doing it. And your computer or your laptop will work with long strings of these bits, such as this. And then uh, there is a quantum analog to this, which is the quantum bit or the qubit. And this also has zero and one. Um, but the cool thing is a state can uh, exist in any superposition also of zero and one. So you can have a large amount of zero and a little bit of one, or sort of here I've shown a state where there's equal amounts of zero and one. It's not constrained just to be in zero or in one. Um, and you might ask, okay, so I represented zero and one with a classical bit as being a voltage. Um, what does the zero and one of the qubit maybe correspond to? So you can use an atom, for example, and say that the ground state of the atom will be your zero or your spin down state. Um, and an excited state of the atom will be your one or your spin up state. And then you can move between the two of these using a laser. So you come in with your laser and you just move the atom into the excited state. Um, a useful way of viewing this is actually on the surface of what's known as the block sphere. Um, so this is a really nice geometrical um, way of representing this. So you have zero at the south pole and one at the north pole. And then the vector, which is your state that you're interested in, is the green arrow. So here we're going to start in zero. And then you come in with your laser and you rotate your state all the way around up to one. 
And if you're on the surface of the block sphere like we are here, then you're in a pure state. Um, you can also exist inside the block sphere. Um, often this will occur when there's unwanted interactions between your, your pure state that you started with and the environment. Um, and then you will end up in what's known as a mixed state, and that's inside the block sphere. So a very useful way then of representing um, your state is through what's known as the density matrix of it. So I've left up um, what I just showed on the last slide to the left here um, for reference. Um, and then the density matrix is normally uh, symbolized by rho here. Um, and it's given this strange sort of mathematical notation. If you don't follow this bit, don't worry. Um, but for those who do understand it, it might give a little bit more context to what's going on. Um, but the important thing is, um, if you know rho, that contains all the information about your state psi. So rho is really what you want to know about the state of your, your quantum system. That's what you want to get out. Um, and that's what uh, we'll be discussing later on in the talk with this protocol um, using entropy and entanglement to sort of find out information about Rho. And then finally, we have entanglement. Um, and this is uh, what Einstein didn't really like, and he called it spooky ac action at a, at a distance quite famously. Um, if you have two particles that are entangled, um, then their measurement outcomes will always be correlated. So you can think of it if they're entangled such that the outcomes are always, um, the outcomes of their spins are always opposite, then if you make a measurement on one of them and you find it in the up state, then you know straight away that the other one is in the down state. And so these measurements are always correlated. So good. Um, okay, so now I will go on to the experiment that I was using. Um, so I already mentioned this before. So now we have um, an ion instead of an atom, because I work with trapped ions. Um, and it's in the down state. And you come in with a laser and you can promote it to an excited state. Um, and that's what we normally use as our zero and one. Um, and in the black group, um, in the specific experiment, we use calcium. Uh, it's quite a nice iron. It has a very simple level structure. So here, the down state or the, the zero state is um, the ground state of the of the iron, and that's the S1 half state. And then you also have the D, um, D5 half state up here. Um, and that's uh, the excited state. So that's the, the one, essentially. Um, and you can couple between these two using a 729 nanometer laser, which we call the qubit laser. Um, and then you might ask, OK, so how do I now detect which state I'm in? Um, with a classical bit, uh, you might assume you can take a voltmeter and measure the voltage. Um, how do I do the same with my qubits? And we use a laser at 397 to do this on this transition. So if you are in the S state, um, when you shine in this laser, your ion will fluoresce like crazy on this transition. And you'll see it here as being really, really bright on your camera. If you're in the D state, so the excited state up here, you can't fluoresce at all, so you remain dark. And this is actually a picture we took at the bottom here. Um, so it's just a long string of ions in our trap where everything is in the S state because everything is fluorescing. So this here is quite cool. So I just took this video on my phone, um, actually. Um, and this is a uh, image of, so let's play this. This is actually the ions in real time on the camera um, that are twinkling. So I'm driving them with the qubit laser and taking them from the S state to the D state and back again. And so that's why you see them twinkling. And that's really, really cool to actually be able to see that um, in the lab on the camera to actually be able to see ions. I, I can never quite get over that. Good. So, um, so far I've talked about the iron, but I haven't really mentioned the trap. Um, so we use a linear pull trap. This thing is a couple of inches in length. Um, I think that's about six, six or seven centimeters. And it has four radio frequency blade electrodes. Um, so these are, one is here, and then one is behind it. And then there's another one up here. And then again, there's another one behind it. And these oscillate between positive and negative voltage um, at an RF frequency, so at about 29 megahertz. 
And then we also have two uh, DC electrodes. So these are held at a constant voltage there, and that provides confinement along the axial direction, so along the tips of the trap. And what this does is it creates a time varying saddle potential. So here I've got another little video. So this is rotated by 90 degrees. So in this diagram, you'd have the DC electrodes, one comes from the top and the other one comes from the bottom down here. And this is the potential that's formed by those blade electrodes. So if it's not oscillating at all between positive and negative, your iron in the middle here will want to roll down the potential down there. But now if it is oscillating it can't because the potential changes so it wants to roll down here it then can't because the potential changes and so on so your iron just sort of makes very small little oscillations around the middle of the trap and then it can't escape in this direction or this direction because then you have those dc electrodes providing the confinement so what you end up with is a nice long linear string in the middle of your iron trap and then um, we address the ions using a 729 nanometer laser, um, like I mentioned before, but we have quite a few of these. So it's the same laser, but we split it into several different paths, depending on what we um, want to do. So we have a very, very broad beam, which we call the global beam, and this addresses all the ions at the same time um, and does the same operation on them. But we also have a single ion addressing beam um, that's very, very narrow, and it really addresses only one ion at a time. So if you have a chain of 20 ions all in the ground state and you want to put ion 7 into the excited state, you can just address it with the addressing beam and do that, which is a really, really powerful tool. Um, and it's a really nice system. So um, now I'm going to move on to how we engineer the dynamics in our system. So how we engineer the entangling dynamics. Um, so far, I've been talking exclusively about the electronic state, so the state of the iron. So when we are in the ground state and excited state, I've been representing that with um, a down arrow and an up arrow. We also now have an extra degree of freedom thanks to the trap, which is the emotional state of the iron. So if you're in the zero emotional state, the iron is just in the center of your trap, it's not moving at all. Um, but you can put a quanta of energy in. It's a bit like if you have a pendulum and it's motionless and then you go and perturb the pendulum, it will swing backwards and forwards. The iron can do a very, very similar kind of motion. So you can write a phonon into the system so it does this motion or you can write more phonons into the system and in that case it will swing with a bigger amplitude. Uh, to do this, so here we have h-bar omega naught is just equivalent to our 729 nanometer laser. Um, and we just sort of detune our laser by an amount plus delta omega, um, which is resonant with this transition, um, in order to excite the ion, so we excite it to an excited state, and also write a phonon in. And likewise, if we're in a ground state, uh, a down state, sorry, over here with the electronic um, degree of freedom, and we have one phonon in the system, we can take that phonon out of the system by using a red sideband transition. Now, these transitions can then be used in order to implement entangling dynamics through using the Molmer-Zorensen or the MS gate or interaction. Um, this can be understood as follows. So I've done it here just for two ions, um, but you can generalize it to an ion string. Um, it just gets very, very messy then with the diagram. So here we have two ions side by side and they're both in the electronic ground state. And I've said, okay, they're in the state with N phonons in the system. This can be zero, it can be a hundred, it doesn't really matter. Um, so I say, okay, I now come in with two beams at the same time, one of which is resonant with the blue sideband transition and one with the red sideband transition. And I say, okay, the ion on the left absorbs the photon from the blue sideband transition, um, and then the ion on the right then absorbs a photon from the red sideband transition, and you end up going from down, down to up, up. Uh, but you can say, well, the, the first ion might have instead absorbed a, a red sideband transition photon first, it doesn't matter. And likewise, because of the symmetry, the ion on the right might have done it first, so you get this picture built up. So from what I just said, when everything is resonant, if you stop these dynamics halfway through, what you'll find is that you'll have um, some of the state will be in down, down, some will be in up, down, down, up, and some will be in up, up, which is quite messy and doesn't really help you with anything. 
But now, if you did tune away from this transition, from the blue uh, sideband transition and the red sideband transition, by the same amount, if you did tune your lasers away, what you find is that the overall resonance is still there. So you still go from down, down to up, up. But the probability to populate these up, down and down, up levels becomes very, very small. So if you stop the dynamics halfway through, what you end up with is your um, state of your two ions are partly in down, down and partly in up, up, but virtually no population is in up, down and down, up. And that's a maximally entangled bell state, one of the maximally entangled bell states. And so now you've created an entangling gate, an entangling interaction. And this is the basis of what we use in our system. So this is the Hamiltonian for it. Um, so this is the mol mazurin interaction part where you have a sigma x, sigma x, which is just as one spin goes from down to up, the other one must also go from down to up. You can only ever have these pairwise spin flips. Or likewise, if you start in up down, um, you will flip to down up. And what we do is we do something very similar, but we add an extra term here, which practically we implement just by detuning our lasers again by an additional amount. So it's very straightforward to implement. And if you make this very, very large, which we often do, um, it's quite a nice thing that happens. It becomes very unlikely that you'll get down, down to up, up happening. You'll just normally get up, down to down, up and vice versa happening. This is uh, quite a few um, perks to it, but one of the major ones is that if you start with a 10 ion chain, for example, and you have five ions in the excited state to begin with and five ions in the down unexcited state, and then you apply your interaction, you know that the ex number of excitations in the system must be conserved. So after your dynamics, you should still have five excitations left. So if you don't have five excitations left, you know that something has gone very, very wrong and you need to fix it and figure out what's going on. So that, that's really, really helpful for us. So um, practically, we then do this as follows in the system. So we have a beam that contains both the red and the blue um, sideband frequencies detuned a bit coming in at the same time. And we use our broad uh, global beam to do this so it illuminates all the ions at the same time um, and this has a coupling strength of jij so the more power you have in your beam the stronger this coupling will be and the faster your dynamics will be and the dynamics itself sort of looks like this so at the top here we have a 14 ion chain and um, so everything that's blue is in the down state so these are all seven ions that are in the down state and then one in the middle is put in the up state, so the excited state. And then again, all these lines here are in the down state. And then the Hamiltonian, the HIsing Hamiltonian is turned on. And this excitation, it then flip flops out through the system, kind of like a wave in a way. Um, and you can make sort of more interesting dynamics happen if you have a more interesting initial state. So here we've got the nail state where all the odd ions start in the, in the excited state, so one, three, five, and all the uh, even ions start in the, the down, the unexcited state, and then we turn on the Hamiltonian, these excitations start spreading out and it becomes quite cool. So here they interfere, you can see, and you get like a very large excitation on this ion. Here you get pretty much no excitation. And what it transpires is, is that after a few milliseconds evolution of this, uh, so at, for example, about this point here, you get interesting um, entangled states start forming, which is good if you're uh, trying to build a quantum simulator like we are. So this is what the lab itself actually looks like. Um, so this table is full of lasers for cooling and everything. Um, this is the laser, uh, the table with the qubit laser on it. The trap itself is housed in here. So this is the vacuum chamber you can just see and the trap is in the middle of it. So it's kept under about 10 to the minus 10 vacuum. Um, and then there's this metal shielding around it, which helps um, keep out any fluctuations from magnetic fields and things like that. So um, now I'm gonna change gears a bit and go on to characterizing entanglement through using what's known as the second order Renyi entropy. So I mentioned before that we, we want to have a large amount of entanglement in our system uh, in order to sort of build a realistic quantum simulator. 
Um, and now, how do we know what's going on in our system? Um, right now, with less than 20 ions, you can classically simulate this quite straightforwardly. Um, but that sort of defeats the whole point of building a quantum simulator. You don't want to be in a regime that you can simulate classically. You want to go to more interesting regimes. So how do you then know that uh, your simulator is performing as you'd expect it to do and it's doing the right calculation essentially for you? Um, so you want to characterize um, certain quantities that can help you understand what's going on in your simulator. And one of these is obviously characterizing how much entanglement is there. Um, and there's several ways in which you can already do this. Um, quantum state tomography is a very powerful method and that reconstructs the entire density matrix row. So if you have row, you, you don't just have what's going on with entanglement in your system, you, you know everything about the state there. Um, so that's very good, except that it scales very, very badly with the number of qubits. So above about eight qubits, it's pretty much infeasible to, to realistically implement. And eight qubits is very easy to simulate with a classical computer. Like I can simulate that in a couple of seconds, pretty much with my laptop. Um, so that doesn't really help us very much. Um, you can have instead efficient tomographic methods, which is an extension to gate set tomography. Um, and this is great because it can be used on larger numbers of qubits, so sort of 14 to 20 qubits, um, but it only works well on weakly entangled states, which is a limiting factor for two reasons. It means, one, while well, you are throwing away a huge amount of the potential states that might be interesting, um, and two, it means you have to actually know that you're only going to be working with weakly entangled states in the first place. Um, ideally, you don't want to know anything about the state that you'll be preparing. That's uh, what you want the simulator to tell you about. Um, so with this, you really need to know that you will only be um, making weakly entangled states in order for it to work well. And so we'd like something that we can use on a larger number of qubits, but we don't have to know anything about the state that we're preparing. And this is where measuring the second order Renyi entropy comes in, because there was a previous protocol that used this, um, and it used it was in Griner's group back in 2016, and it used two identical copies of the system, so two identical uh, opt they used uh, optical lattices to do this, so atoms and optical lattices, and they had two of them side by side, and they made collective measurements on these two identical copies of row. Um, and it was great because it made no assumptions about the state of the system and it scaled quite well, but it required that you have the two optical lattices side by side, um, which for trapped ions is not so feasible. You don't really want to have multiple sort of iron traps side by side next to each other. So this motivated looking at uh, using this entropy, but in a way that didn't require you to have two copies of the system. So first, what is this entropy. Um, so it's defined in this way. So you've got the, the second order entropy on the left, and then you have minus log two of trace rho squared on the right. And it's quite powerful because of this trace rho squared term. Um, because of the nonlinear non dependence on rho, um, you're not reconstructing the full state of the system. You're not reconstructing rho. What you're doing instead is you're getting out uh, important information, useful information from the system um, that you can use, which means you need less measurements in order to get that. Um, but it, it's still useful information that you can use to characterize the system. Um, and just a little bit of terminology. So the trace row squared is also called the purity, and I will be using that later on. So the entropy is just related to the purity through minus log two of the purity. So you might think, okay, great. I mean, we can get this entropy, but why do we care about doing that? How does that help us with entanglement? Um, and there's a very, very nice link between the two. If you consider just a chain of ions um, and look at the first five of them, and let's call that subsystem A, then what you can show is that there's bipartite entanglement existing between the subsystem A and the rest of the system if the entropy of the subsystem is greater than that of the entropy of the whole system. And that's really quite powerful because it means if you can make a measurement of the entropy, then you can get information about the entanglement in the system out. 
So we now have this condition um, for getting entanglement in the system. We need to measure that the entropy of the subsystem is greater than that of the whole system. And that's where this new protocol comes in. Um, so this protocol is based on uh, local random unit trees. So bear with me on this for a moment. So these are unit trees drawn from the circular unit, unit tree ensemble. Um, and that was meaningless to me when I first heard it. So I'll try and explain it how I understand it now. Um, what this means is these unit trees are just randomly drawn from an ensemble such that if you start with a pure state, for example, let's start um, in the zero, so at the south pole of the pure block sphere, which is here given in blue, then you'll be randomly rotated. Uh, if, if you've randomly drawn a unit tree, then you'll ra be randomly rotated anywhere on the surface of the block sphere with equal probability. And likewise, instead, if you started in a bit of a mixed state, so the red state here, uh, red sphere here, sorry, um, you'll be randomly rotated to any other place um, with equal probability on the surface of this little shrunken block sphere there. Um, and what the protocol does, is it's actually quite simple. It just um, applies these local random unit trees to each ion. So you randomly draw U1, so the unit tree one, and it'll randomly rotate ion one. Likewise, U2 will rotate ion two all the way to Un, which will rotate your ion N. But it's important that it really does rotate it to any other place on the surface of the sphere with equal probability. Why does this work? There's a bit of a physical understanding you can get if you just consider one iron or one qubit to start with. So imagine you prepare again in, in S, the S state, the ground state, and you randomly rotate somewhere, uh, and then you measure sigma z, and that means you really make a measurement of, is your iron, is it bright or is it dark? You shine in that 397 laser and you see whether it fluoresces or not. And then you prepare again in the, the ground state zero, and then you make a different random rotation and you measure. And you do this many, many times again and again. And what you can do, so you can express this, your state row um, in terms of the length of your block vector. Um, so if you take the trace row squared of this, and then providing it really does rotate to any other um, place on the surface of the sphere with equal probability, you can get a relation between the trace row squared, which was the purity, and this sigma z measurement outcome. So if you have a relation between sigma z and the purity, then you naturally have a relation between sigma z and the Rennie entropy. Um, and for those of you who um, know, um, uh, tomography, you might say, okay, but that's kind of crazy. If I've just got one qubit, I can make three three measurements on it, and then I, I can basically reconstruct row. Um, and you'd be absolutely right. It'd be madness to do this protocol just on one qubit. Um, that's not what it was designed for. It was designed for sort of tens of ions, and that's where it becomes powerful, and that's where the scaling really improves. So, the protocol itself, it was designed by Andreas Elden and Benoit Vermeersch of Peter Zoller's group, also um, in Innsbruck. And so, yeah, you really just apply these random rotations. So you prepare your state of interest, and then you apply these random rotations to each ion in turn. Um, and then you get this, this really hideous expression out. So on the left, you have the entropy is minus log two of, here it's called X bar, but that was uh, previously the purity or the trace row squared. And X itself, X bar is just X averaged over the unit trees. Um, X is given by, by this awful expression. Um, and you can kind of ignore this bit and this bit because it's it's pretty much just scaling factors, actually. And the important part is this bit over here. And this is where um, the information is held and statistical cross correlations between the outcomes of the measurements. And that means if you, um, it's asking the question, if um, iron two is down, is iron five always up? Um, or if iron three is in, 0.4 is iron 9 or is in 0.7 and it looks at all these correlations between the outcomes and averages over them and then it gives access to this entropy term here and if we have the entropy then as seen before we have the entanglements so to practically implement this in the experiment um, we prepared the nail state which is the up down up down up down 
And then we evolved it under our Hamiltonian um, for different time steps of tau. And then we applied these random local unit trees to each ion, and then we made a Sigma Z measurement. So we asked if it's bright or dark. And then we repeated this 500 times. Each time we changed the local unit trees we were applying. So really randomized them completely. And now uh, some results. So on the left, we have the purity and on the right, we have the Rene entropy. Um, and this was for a 10 ion chain that we first looked at. So you can see if we start on the left, um, zero milliseconds uh, time evolution is in purple. So this means we just prepared the nail state and then we did the protocol. So we did the random rotation straight away on that. And we know with the nail state, um, it's a product state. So there should be no entanglement in the system. And if we then look at the Rennie entropy for, for the zero milliseconds, we see that the subsystems have roughly the same entropy um, as the whole system, the whole tenine system here, which is what we would expect um, for a product state. And so it gets more interesting as you look now to five milliseconds time. Um, as you can see then, the subsystems have a much higher entropy than the entropy of the whole system over here at 10. Um, and if we remember from a few slides ago, if the entropy of the subsystems is greater than that of the whole system, you know that you have bipartite entanglement in the system. And we actually looked at this for all of the subsystems at five milliseconds in that 10 ion chain. Um, so here, the, all the one ion subsystems are just ion one and then ion two and then ion three and so on. Um, so all the permutations um, of these subsystems. And the lines here are at three um, sigma below the mean. Um, and the dotted line is three sigma above the 10 ion entropy. Um, and you can see none of these overlap, which means that to within three sigma, we have entanglement between all the bipartitions in the system. And then finally, uh, we decided we look at a 20 ion chain. Um, so unfortunately back then, our single ion addressing wasn't as good. Um, so we couldn't really apply it to all 20 ions. So what we did, we um, prepared 20 ions in the nail state, evolved those 20 ions under the Hamiltonian, and then applied the protocol to the 10 middle ions. So from ions six through to 15. But we did it for a bit longer this time. We evolved it out to 10 milliseconds. Um, and you can see that this low entropy initial Neal state is evolving into very high entropy sections in this. And this is uh, consistent with the formation of highly entangled states in the system. Um, so um, I'm coming now pretty much to the end. So uh, this is the black group with the people who contributed to this um, significantly highlighted, um, Ben Warren and Andreas. And so thank you very much for your attention and thank you to Enos. Um, and I will hand you back to Enos and Colin. Thank you very much, Tiffany, for this great and insightful presentation. And again, I would like to remind everyone that uh, questions can be posted in the question box in the control panel on your right. So I saw some questions were already coming in, which is good. But then the Q&A session will begin just after our next talk, which is presented by Colin Coates. Thank you, Ines, and thank you very much, Tiffany, for the excellent presentation. Um, I hope my screen is sharing okay, so I want to proceed on that basis and someone can shout if not and uh, so this this is just around the uh, the webinar session off I'm going to give a brief high level overview of some detector solutions that we have within the umbrella of, of quantum optics now quantum optics is quite a broad umbrella so the way I've chosen to do this is just to select a few different um, fairly popular types of optical systems optical experimental setups uh, within quantum optics outline the challenges from the detector point of view and then state what, what we recommend as solutions. Uh, so the first one I've chosen is where you would want to image entangled photon pairs. Now, now Tiffany's already done a really good job of, of defining what an entangled photon pair is, so there's no need to, to go over that again, but this type of system is one where you would have a, a biphoton photon entangled pair where you would detect each photon of the correlated pair on the same imaging detector. 
Um, so th there's a couple of key requirements for this and largely relates to ultimately the throughput or the measurement throughput of the experiments which have the potential to take up to years that um, in some cases to do them but we don't have years to wait normally so we want to find ways of, of multiplexing it and, and rattling these things along as fast as possible. So there's a number of things that feed into this. Um, one will be that when you see an event you know it's from a photon and not from a dark background event um, from the detector itself. So it's the ability to capture and discriminate spatially correlated photon pairs with good statistical confidence, and that's key. Um, and then, of course, fast counting is needed as well um, to get through these, these experiments and build up useful imagery at the end of it. Um, you do have to do quite a number of iterations of counts. Um, so fast counting will, will, will hugely accelerate the measurement process as well. And why do you want to do this apart from just, well, aside from just pure um, fundamental quantum physics research, um, there are potential real world applications to it as well. For one thing, uh, you can use quantum imaging approaches with entangled photons to actually get better signal to noise ratio. Uh, there's a good recent example here from the Miles Paget group. And also you can also use quantum entangled photon approaches to enhance resolution. Um, so that, uh, and there will be more besides, but that's a couple of um, of key potential um, actual real world benefits of, of following this type of quantum path. So the the, the, rec the recommended um, tried and tested solution for many years in the market is to use an electron multiplying CCD. So Andor's X and Ultra is our key recommendation here. So an EMCCD um, is basically it's a it's a signal amplifying technology which is capable of, of registering a single photon event. So, you, so obviously to detect, to do single photon counting experiments, you need a very, very sensitive technology. This is great in that it combines single photon sensitivity with, with what's called back illumination, which means that it can collect more than 90% of the incident photons as well. So you're, you're, you're wasting very few of the photons that are incident on the detector you're registering as events. Another benefit of using um, basically an imaging array approach as a detector as, a point, as opposed to a single point detector is just the, this, this massive multiplexing advantage you get when counting, um, so simply by virtue of the fact that you could be using a megapixel array uh, rather than single points. So, so that, that can take your measurements from years down to hours uh, um, by itself. Um, and then also very important, even though the detectors are single photon sensitive, um, there are other potential sources of noise in the detectors, uh, which are known as dark current and also clock induced charge. And they are amplified by the very same mechanism that we use to amplify the photons. Um, so we have to do something quite careful in that camera to make sure that those sources of noise are reduced to as low as we possibly can to, to a small fraction of a percentage chance that if you see an event, that it's from a it's from a dark event. Uh, we want to know with a really good sense of of, um, of assurance that these events are from photons. Um, so that's really important to, to build that statistical confidence. Uh, I mentioned the count rates. So so typically EMCCDs operate full full resolution in the sort of tens of maybe 50 frames per second. But once you start to, to sub-array them down into smaller regions of interest, of course, you can access then hundreds of frames per second. So that basically much defines the rate that you can count um, photon pairs at. And then the other aspect for this particular type of system, um, very often when you're looking at these, these correlated biphotons, they can appear spatially very, very close to each other on the array, maybe one or two pixels apart. Uh, so we have to be quite careful to, to some subtleties of imaging that um, th there is a chance that when you have an event, a photon on a single pixel, that charge has a mechanism to spread across to a neighboring pixel. Uh, so that's obviously a bad thing if you're trying to detect actual events, which can be a neighboring pixel. So we have to pay extra attention to make sure that's going to, there's a very, very small probability of charge spreading across neighboring pixels during the readout of the detector. So that, that's, a, that's a, a real fast summary of why we recommend that detector. There's obviously a lot more detail to that, but hopefully that gives you a, a reasonable idea. Uh, the other type of entangled photon system I thought I would introduce is, is the quantum ghost imaging. Tiffany already, already um, 
raised this term of spooky action at a distance, this, this Einstein term. Um, that's pretty much what we're seeing in these types of systems where you would have an entangled photon pair, but send them in completely different directions. Um, and only one of the photons is going to the imaging array. The other will be interacting, and it could be of a very different wavelength, the other will be interacting photon at a time with an object. Um, or, or and then getting and then being detected by what's called a heralding detector, which is which is usually a single point detector. But that single point detector then tells the imaging detector, yep, get ready to, to receive an event yourself from, from, from my pair, from my from my identical twin, if you like. And that's what happens. So that basically means that there's a, a mechanism to to build up an image on the imaging detector of an object which those photons that went that direction never did actually encounter themselves. So that's the mechanism. And because of that, because of this, this, this temporal synchronization capability, the detector has to have an additional type of technology which enables that temporal synchronization with very short shuttering times. And before I move on to you, I should say, yeah, there's the potential real world application of this could be, for example, that when you want to, to um, interrogate an object say with an infrared wavelength and detect in the visible um, that could be one actual practical means of, of deploying this type of, of ghost imaging system so the type of detector which we recommend for this is an intensified camera so this can be applied to either ccd or what's called scientific cmos technology but basically it, it, it's, it's different because it has this additional front end which, which is a fast shuttering system um, so we don't have time to go through the details of, of what this, this involves, but it's basically capable of, of shuttering down to about two nanoseconds. So, so that defines the optical shuttering time. And then you can synchronize that to the heralding detector. Um, so that means you get this, this precise measurement of correlation in the temporal domain um, as well as the spatial domain. And then, of course, uh, Again, you want your statistics, your statistical confidence of photon detection to be as high as possible, but there are potential sources of, of single pixel events um, in this technology as well. And it's not called clock and juice charge this time, it's actually called EBI, um, equivalent background illuminance. But there are mechanisms through cooling to reduce these, these sources of false positives as well. So Moving on to the next challenge, and I thought I would choose quantum gases and trapped ions as a general field here. So even within that, of course, that's a really, really broad area. Uh, but, but I've noticed over the years that uh, some of the recurring things that are asked of our detectors, well, first of all, that um, it's good often that they are capable of very, very broad spectral response across a, across a wide wavelength range. And that's more to introduce the flexibility for, for usage in the detector that we can, you know, we can use them for ytterbium ions right up to rubidium um, absorption experiments at 70, 80 nanometers, so UV right through to near infrared. Um, and then it depends on the system, uh, but People either use, say, for a Bose-Einstein condensate, they very often use absorption imaging. And the, the, the benefits of that is you, you, that affords then local density distribution information from within the, the atom clouds. Sometimes, as, as in the case we just heard from Tiffany's presentation, uh, there can be very few atoms or ions involved, and therefore fluorescence can be a much more effective uh, modular or means of interrogating uh, these trapped species um, in such small quantities. Uh, but but then of course with fluorescence you have less scope for for in a Bose-Einstein condensate for getting information on the local density distribution. So very often these these approaches are are considered complementary. Absorption and imaging can be quite often combined, um, and very often fast dynamics are needed. Um, it depends on again on the type of experimental system, but very often we're looking for for change um, time resolution in milliseconds or even microseconds time regimes. So let's break it down by absorption and fluorescence. Absorption, first of all, the most common type of CCD used uh, for absorption, if you're only doing absorption, is, is a CCD, a straightforward, you know, slow scan, deep cooled CCD. And the main benefit there is, you, um, at least today, you can get CCDs that extend very well into the near infrared and right down into the, into the pretty hard UV. They have very, very broad mechanisms for, for 
for affording very, very broad spectral response. So that can be great for, for doing things like rubidium absorption imaging, which uses a 780 nanometer laser. Uh, you would use what's called a deep depletion type of CCD then. Um, there is actually a means, even though these are relatively slow readout technologies, there is a means to do on-head burst dynamics, uh, which means you fill up the, the sensor itself with dynamic information um, and, then, and then slowly read it out. And you can actually get dynamics quite readily into the microsecond and a millisecond regime by doing this. And then on the fluorescent side, it's back to the detector we talked about a little earlier, the Exxon Ultra EMCCD. Um, this is an absolutely brilliant detector for, for low light fluorescence imaging. And we have examples here of, um, of, a, of an MOT with very discrete amounts of atoms in it as they enter and leave the trap. And of course, we have one that we, that we just would have seen perfect examples of there of lines of trapped ions as well. And you can imagine these are very, very low light circumstances, um, only handfuls of photons in any given exposure time uh, coming from each of these imaged ions. So finally, um, within the, the umbrella of quantum optics, um, I wanted to touch on experiments that are to characterize what you would call quantum materials or quantum emitters. And examples I've given here could be nitrogen, nitrogen vacancy centers, quantum dots, or, or even development of any type of quantum light source. Uh, very often, spectroscopy is used as, as, a, as a modality for this type of characterization. Um, and photoluminescence spectroscopy with that is, is, is pretty much the key word that you will associate with this. So, um, so this is a typical experimental layout here, and you'll notice a few things that there's a spectrometer in here for, for the spectroscopic dispersion, and there is a detector, a spectroscopic detector, and also, also there's a cryostat in this system here, because quite often a lot of these experiments are done at low temperatures. So the um, the types of solutions, we don't really have time to go through the full portfolio of Andor spectroscopic solutions, but there's quite a sizable one, as you can see from, the, from, this, uh, from this layout here, and it's worth going on. We have a section of our website um, that's devoted entirely to spectroscopic solutions. It's worth going on there for a browse because um, it is quite, uh, quite in-depth and quite broad. And finally, um, as you know, Andor are part of Oxford Instruments, and Oxford Instruments also produce optical an optical cryostat range. And you can see an example here called the OptiStat, and there's the optical section at the bottom. So this is very complementary technology to these types of spectroscopic experiments, which are involved in characterizing quantum materials. So that was a bit of a of a rush through of our solutions, but I hope you took something from it and and. By all means, uh, feel free to browse more about this on our website. We have quite a lot of information on our quantum solutions on the Android website. So thank you very much. And thank you very much again, Tiffany, as well. Yeah, so thank you so much, Tiffany and Colin, again, for your great presentations. And I think I would also just like to mention again, because you showed it on your previous slide, Colin, uh, the Ixon Ultra EMCCD. So with the given example, this was also the camera that was used in the experiment uh, from the group of Tiffany. Um, so just to kind of close the circle. And uh, yeah, now I would like to um, just go through some questions. Uh, there were some good ones that came through. So I would start with a question for Tiffany. So the question is, how does your protocol scale with the size of the subsystem you want to determine the entropy for? Okay, I think this is a really good question. Um, so I'm just going to steal the um, screen back from <laughs> Colin, sorry, because um, I uh, have, it's easier to show on a slide because it's really ugly. Um, so this is how it scales with the size of the, the subsystem you're interested in. So here NA is the subsystem. Um, so it scales as not, uh, two to the 0.8 NA. Um, and then the 7.7 .7 is, is effectively a constant scaling factor at the front of it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, one, one more thing I should say is actually, oh, sorry, sorry uh, Ines, <laughs> no, it, um, it's interesting because actually for entangled pure states, the scaling can actually be better and it can go down to about 0 0.6 NA. So actually, um, for, yeah, for um, more separable states, it scales uh, a little bit worse. 
Okay, thank you, Tiffany. Um, I will then ask you another question. Um, are you aware of any experimental protocol that does not rely on quantum state tomography and is able to measure the von Neumann entropy and not some Rene entropy? So um, I think there is a paper that came out last year by um, Del Monte. Um, I think it was published by the Institute of Physics and they um, uh, suggested a protocol that can measure the von Neumann entropy, so not through randomized um, rotations, but through other means. Um, but what is interesting, though, is that the Rennie entropy I've measured, uh, mentioned is actually one of many. So there's a huge spectrum of these Rennie entropies. We looked at the second order one. In the limit where it goes to the first order one, it actually reduces to the von Neumann entropy. So the yeah the von Neumann entropy is actually a limit of uh, one of these Rainy entropies, which is quite interesting. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the next question for you, so there are just more and more questions coming in. Uh, but can you symmetry resolve your S two? So meaning you resolve by the local projected state in the subsystem. Um, I'm gonna have to read that question. Sorry. Uh, do you have yes. access to the question box? Yes, I do. It's okay. Perfect. Uh, can I symmetry resolve the S2? Um, resolve by the local projected state in the subsystem. So I, I need to ask a question back to that. So do you mean um, by, uh, for example, just detecting um, two of the ions, for example? Do you mean that um, can I then detect two of the ions and then get more information about the whole of the system out. Okay, I think the response was any locally conserved quantum number. Huh. I'm not sure of the answer to that. Um, not at all. Um, I would have to ask one of the theorists that worked with us on it um, because that is outside of my my knowledge, I'm afraid, sorry. Oh, thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, I think I will mix in a question for Colin. <laughs> um, so Colin, uh, can a detector be used to measure optical plasma emission in vacuum chambers full of excited gas mixtures? Yeah, the, uh, the most common type of detector for plasma imaging is, is the intensified cameras. Um, that we showed in the context of, of ghost imaging. So for sure, the, um, these types of intensified detectors are used quite routinely for, pla for fast plasma imaging. Okay, thank you, Colin. And then one last question for Tiffany. Um, might the entropy or noise in the system contain useful information that is being thrown away? Um, I'd say the, the entropy is sort of the useful information. So by making the measurements, um, we, we make the measurements and it extract the information about all the subsystems and the, the total system. And then by looking at whether the entropy of um, some of the subsystems is higher, then you can infer the presence of entanglement from that. And so it's not necessarily that we're throwing things away. Um, we're more using sort of the, the higher entropy to infer information about the system. Perfect. I'm just checking. Um, can we take one more question? Um, just checking. So Tiffany, I would also need you to look into the question box. Um, mm -hmm. that we, would be the second question that came in. It starts with, is it possible with your protocol to measure the entropy of ions that are not spatially connected? And ah. it says, for example, the Rini entropy of the, and I guess I would think reduced density matrix mm -hmm. of row <laughs> two and eight. So um, it's just some simple yes. so to look at it. <laughs> So the answer to this is yes. So these, these are all really, really good questions. Um, yes, yeah, so here on this plot, that's uh, sort of what you see. So for example, you've given the uh, example of a, a two qubit system. 
And so here we have all the two qubit systems, so one and two, one and eight, two and eight, and everything like that. Um, so this this here is the those reduced density matrices plotted. So all permutations of all subsystems. Awesome. And then one more. Uh, can you get Rini index one one half? Uh, this would be a good way to access the to the negativity. Oh, that's a very interesting question. Um, as far as I'm aware, um, the indexes are only integers, so they run from one to infinity. So the the general Rainy entropy is is uh, s to the n, and then uh, some prefactor, and then log to the uh, log of trace row to the n. Um, and so as far as I'm aware. Uh, then it would only be integers, um, and so no. Um, but that's a very interesting question, and I'd really like to look further into that because that would be, yeah, that would be really nice. Um, so yeah, sorry. <laughs> I guess the the summed answer is um, I don't think so, but I'm not a hundred percent sure, and it would be very interesting um, to look into. Yeah, I would also like to mention that any other questions that we didn't get to answer yet um, and all the information that we have here in the question box, I, I can pass this all on to Tiffany. Um, if there are any outstanding topics, uh, if Tiffany, you would like to discuss uh, with the people who asked the questions or if there are even some yeah. more questions that come up from the audience. So I will definitely um, put you in touch. Uh, I think those are really interesting conversations. <laughs> And um, yeah, with that, I would like to thank everyone. And also just uh, for your information, this webinar will be available. So the recording will be available uh, within a week. And yeah, thanks again for your contributions, uh, Tiffany and Colin, and for everyone's uh, attention and for attending. And yeah, I uh, wish you all a great rest of the day. And hopefully see you next time. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye.